Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Libby Marchant and I'm here with Brian Conaghan, order of, uh, order? author of The M Words, uh, which is his new-ish book. Um, new and we're here to talk about it. So welcome, Brian. How are you? I'm good. Um, I was just, so I want to be a writer as well, hopefully someday when I grow up. And I was just wondering <laughs> <laughs> if the economy can handle it. The economy um, can. It can <laughs> handle one more writer. Yeah, hopefully. Um, and I was just wondering what inspired you of all the perspectives to pick to write from the perspective of a 17 year old girl? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> she actually was born out of a book that I had written called uh, When Mr. Dog Bites. And I had written that in 2012. Um, let me just, I've got my books up here, so I'll just grab them oh, and show you. So it, was this, so it was this book, right? Yeah. And one of the characters in this book um, had, was a girl called Michelle, who had oppositional defiance disorder. And I liked the character. And I thought, she was a periphery character in that book, and I thought I wanted to do something with that character. Mm. And so um, I was a teacher for over 15 years. And I taught in secondary school. So I felt I had a strong enough opinion on the teenage male and female voice. Uh, and the character of Michelle is a kind of amalgam of a lot of a lot of female teenagers that I taught, and also Michelle Malloy, who was born out of them in Mr. Dog Bites book. Um, and I wanted to I, the story I wanted to write. I knew I wanted to write, and I knew I wanted to write it from a female perspective. And did and you? That's why. <laughs> did you find it hard to write from a female perspective? Like, what did you have to do to try and get yourself into that kind of headspace almost? Well, I mean, as I said, I mean, it's, it's kind of reverting back to my days as a teacher mm. and looking, I mean, especially in Scotland, where the book's set, and looking at the vernacular and looking at the, the different uh, cadences and intonations that, that differentiate just, sort of, just vocally from teenage boys in Scotland and teenage girls in the area that I grew up in, the area that I taught in. So I think having that experience, you know, 30 odd years experience of living in these communities I felt that like I had the authority to to accurately portray the voice mm. and I think sometimes sometimes we're very fixated on the differences between uh, men and women and boys and girls and teenage boys and teenage girls etc and um, and sometimes the similarities are just stark, um, especially the, I mean, I try to focus on the, the emotion of the character. Yeah. And people, f people feel sadness the same way, irrespective of, of gender. People feel pain the same way. People feel elation and desire and all these emotions that cannot be separated purely through gender. And that's, and that's what I try to focus on yeah. for the character. And so the book is obviously a very emotional book. I was reading it and I was actually like on the verge of tears multiple times. Um, and really? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, was, I, I was trying to make it a quite lighthearted uh, humorous <laughs> book. <laughs> well, it's humorous in some parts, but in other parts it, it breaks my heart. And so... Yeah. How? Try it. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, I can only imagine. Um. So, what ins what inspired you to write such a such a book? Okay. So the inspiration is about uh, grief and loss, yeah. and I lost my best friend, the who who died suddenly, like like um. I'm momentarily, oh, yeah. for, momentarily <laughs> forgotten the name. <laughs> Uh, Moya's best friend, right? So Maggie, I'm the I'm the kind of Maggie character. I feel like and my best friend died, and it's kind of the inspiration was how do you channel that grief? Where do you go with it if you don't have the words? If you can't express what you're feeling, 
and all you've got is this pit in your stomach. You know where it's coming from, but you don't know what to do with it, and you don't know how to get rid of it, and you don't know how to how to live with it. Mm-hmm. So that was a that was a kind of inspiration. Of course, I wasn't seventeen when I lost my my best friend, so I knew I kind of knew what to do with that grief, but I. I did realize that I'd been harboring it for a long, long time. Mm. And so in a purely emotional sense, I knew how to write the character emotionally because I I knew uh, through my own experience what this 17 year old character was going through. Mm. But I guess that's that's the real real, um, inspiration behind the book. Also what's behind it is when I was a teacher, I used to, among other things in my teaching career, I used to be part of the pastoral care team in schools. Yeah. And so you would come, you would, you would um, experience a lot of teenage grief. You would experience a lot of boys and girls who had lost family members, who had lost friends, uh, who had lost friends and family members to suicide. Mm-hmm. So. I was kind of tapping into that experience. Like, I mean, like many writers, you, you have to you have to beg, borrow, and steal, and invent, yeah. and a lot and a lot of it. I mean, basically, it's a book of fiction, but you take your own experience and fictionalize it. So, a lot of it's a lot of, like all my books. There's a lot stolen from from my school days. I'm running out of ideas now, actually. <laughs> You're gonna have to go back to teaching for a little while. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm out it too long now. You've done your time. Done my time. Um, and so I think that one of the main things for me was that I think Maggie really grows as a character from the start. She comes across to other people in her life as quite unlikable, I think, because yeah. they can't see what's going on in her mind. Was that intentional for you that she would almost purposely isolate herself? In yes. Way? Yes, it was wholly. And I mean, if you'd have read the very early draft, she, she was she was obnoxious and she mm. was she was beyond that type of uh, aggression that wasn't real you yeah. know she was almost like a car- a cartoon character so I needed to tone it down but I think we're all f- I think first of all as a writer you're looking at the character development you're looking at yeah. character arcs you know where did he go throughout the journey of the mm. uh, of the book's life and why did he go there and if you have a character who who's who plateaus and uh, emotionally or in their humour or in their state of mind or it just becomes a little bit dull for the reader. Yeah. I like I like my I like my characters to be to be unlikable. I like my characters yeah. to have a, have layers to them. I like my characters to 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 form people's opinion that they, they, they either like them or they don't, you know, and I think that's the reality of the human condition. That's who we are, you know. Yeah. We're not we're not all happy, hopeful characters. Some yeah. some of us are obnoxious, but most of us, in fact, all of us have got vulnerabilities. Just like, just like Maggie has vulnerabilities, mm-hmm. and sometimes, and I've realised this over over the the my my lots of years on earth now, <laughs> that we mask those vulnerabilities, and as a teacher, a lot of people mask their vulnerabilities through silence, mm. through aggression, through humour. You know, so she, this character Maggie, masks her through aggression at times, yeah. and especially at the beginning of the book. But that's always related to the fact that she doesn't know what to do with this grief. Mm. So she's pent up, this angst is always, always bubbling inside her. Yeah. I think she's quite funny myself. I think she's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I think she's, I think she's great. I like her a lot. She's actually. very funny. I like how she um, interacts <clears throat> with the grief counsellor that she sees. I find those interactions quite funny. <laughs> well, those those are types of interactions that I would have had as a teacher in the pastoral care. Yeah. You know, not being, not saying what the grief counsellor Anna does in, in terms, I mean, I've ramped it up a little bit and how are mm. you doing, sweetheart? And yeah. Was, you know, and the kind of uh, airy fairy yeah. approach to but you do come across that a lot you know it's like I'm not wanting to talk to you and I'm not going to talk to you and I'm here yeah. just because I've been told to come here yeah. and I'm going to give you a hard time yeah um and so because this book is aimed at teenagers what 
do you, what would you hope that readers take away when they finish this book? The joy of reading. <clears throat> yeah. Nothing more. Nothing more, the joy of reading. The joy of reading. You know, I always say, why people always say, why did you write, what kind of books do you want to write? And my answer never wavers from day one. I want people to be entertained by it. Yeah. Sure. Um, and I think if you're not entertained by it, close it and put it away. Because it's a struggle to get people. I know this because I never, the first book I read, I was about 17 or 18. I wasn't a very uh, good student at school. And I know when I became an English teacher, how difficult it was for to get people to read, especially boys. But if you give them something relatable, and this is just through experience. If you give them something relatable, something accessible, and something achievable, they'll they'll be really entertained. I think by that, and I think they'll get into the, whatever story you give them. That's why I kind of write a lot of my chapters are quite short. Yeah, I like that as well. Because it's an achievable thing, and I still do this as a reader. You know, I still read. I still pick up a book and go right. How many pages left to the end yeah. of the chapter? Yeah. And then right, okay, right. If I read that, that's a kind. I kind of feel it's a, it's a, it's a kind of sense of achievement that I yeah. get. So I just want people to be entertained by them. That's all. Yeah. And so that's interesting that you didn't start reading until you were seventeen, eighteen. Yeah. Um, and then you went on to become an English teacher. So. What changed Strange. for you then? Well, <clears throat> what changed was I left, I left school with, with no qualifications, but I was very fortunate at that time to, get, to be able to get a job, you know, and I, I got a trade. This was back in the 80s. Um, and it becomes really acute when you're working on building sites in, in the winter. Mm with no qualifications and the mistakes that you've made and the future that's laid out in front of you. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go back to, to, to night school and do my, my leaving cert. Right? And I did also some uh, junior cert courses through that two year period. So I was doing that. And then when I got my qualifications, I had enough qualifications to go to university and I didn't really know what to do. So I felt, I kind of fell into it. But when I was a student, um, I was there in my early twenties. When I was a student, I kind of, I kind of felt I wanted to teach. Yeah. I wanted to go to secondary schools and teach, and I, th I felt as most teachers do, and should do, before it's kicked out of them, they feel as if they can make a difference. Yeah. And I felt as if I could make a difference, and I wanted to make a difference. And do you feel like you have made a difference? Only to myself. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, I hope so, but you'll never, I mean, you'll, you'll never move the mountain, but if you can affect, if you can affect a percentage of boys and girls who you've taught over the years, that's a success, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Some, a, a, lot of my, a lot of students will succeed in spite of the teacher. Yeah. But, I mean, I did teach, I did teach in a few desk schools here in Dublin for a number of years. And sometimes you can see the, the progress that you've made. Mm. So in that sense, you can. Yeah. And so what book <clears throat> has moved you the most? Or that's kind of a hard question. What was the first book that moved you? The first book that moved me? Yeah. That's a very tough question. I feel like the first one was harder, though. I think the, fir the first book that made me, wanted to, made me think that books are good and and so I put the book down and went, "Wow, is this happening? Can this is this possible in the world of of, of words on a page?" Yeah. Was uh, a book called Train Spotting. Oh yeah. You know, and I read Train Spotting in nineteen ninety four. Yeah. So it came out in I think ninety three. Came out, but it was the first time I'd ever seen words written like that. And Only people Scottish speak. people can read Train Spotting, so we well, wouldn't know in Ireland. It's a, it's, a, it's, a it's a tough read. I get that. <laughs> But, but imagine somebody writing in the vernacular that mm. you, you, you grew up speaking and writing in the, the dialect and the, the way that Irving Wells used swearing. Mm. Because I'd never read that before in books. I'd never heard that voice before. So that was a book that, that made me wake up and go, wow, I've never seen or heard characters like this in novels before. Um, and beforehand, when, when I was... 
a student also, and when I was doing my secondary school again, there was a lot of literature that just didn't appeal to me. And you had to read it because you had to tick the boxes of, and that still exists to this day, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it pushes people away as opposed to bringing people together. So. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, especially with, I think secondary school curriculum and college curriculum as well, they tend to pick good books, which just because they were written a hundred years ago doesn't mean that they're necessarily good. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a place for that, but I mean, there's a place for when you, when you're a, when you have an academic approach to a subject like you would at university. I mean, these books are, these books are very important because yeah. in terms of style, in terms of who they, who they have produced as well, what authors have influenced other authors and so on. But a secondary school, I think, and I know this because I've taught English at Leaving Cert here, mm. I think it's a bit more problematic, yeah. you know. I'm trying to study King Lear at the minute and I just, I can't wrap my head around it at the minute, like, <laughs> I'm going to turn into Lear in a second. Well, all I, I, any piece of teacher advice I would give you is, King Lear's a play. Yeah. It's not to be read, it's to be seen. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So, you, any, any reader of theatre is going to be a passive reader, and you're not meant to be a passive reader, you're meant to be right in the action. Yeah. So, unfortunately, you can't go and see it, yeah. but you can, you can watch it online as a theatre production. Yeah. Um, so, more advice, please. <laughs> what, <More> advice. <laughs> what advice would you give to young writers, especially with lockdown coming up? Like, what can <clears throat> writers do with the minute to kind of help themselves? That's a tough question. I get asked that all the time and I don't really have advice, mm -hmm. actually. Libby, I'm sorry to mm -hmm. say. But well, you know, I'm, I'll do the generic thing that most writers say. Read as much as you can. Yeah. Right. And keep writing. But to be on a, on a, on a serious note, if, my, if, if it was a family member, let's say, mm -hmm. if my daughter said I want to write, what would the advice you'd give? I'd say if you when you start something, make sure you finish it. Yeah. Even if it's rubbish, even if it's not going to be published, but make sure you finish it. Make sure you get from point A to point B, mm -hmm. because writing writing books is is as much as anything else about the creativity and the style and and the skill. It's an endurance test mm -hmm. to make this this story start on page one and finish on page three hundred and whatever, yeah. or five hundred or seven hundred. But just finish it. Yeah. And make mistakes. Know that know that you're going to make mistakes. You know, mm -hmm. everybody says I want to be a writer. People are, I know and I did this myself, you know, I want to be a writer. Okay, so what have you written? Nothing. <laughs> yeah. Like we all start off somewhere, don't we? Yeah. Okay. And then some people write the very first thing and it's crap. <laughs> yeah. And they lose they lose confidence. Right. And then they might write a second thing and that's less crap. Mm -hmm. And they just go, that's me, I'm never going to be a writer. But it's like, you've got to practice. Yeah. You know, you can't say I'm going to be a juggler. You're, yeah. going, to, you're, you're going to drop your balls, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, going to drop, you're going to drop them continuously. So you've got to learn to make the mistakes. Yeah. And so with the whole endurance thing, what... Does your what does the daily routine of a writer look like? Is it shoved in a shed for eight hours a day or <laughs> no? No, so I, everybody's different. For me, yeah. for me, I always I, I adhere to the thousand words a day. I do a thousand words a day, okay. um, and sometimes that's five hundred words, and sometimes it's two thousand words. But mm. uh, I give myself a kind of rule to write a book a year. So if my books are between sixty and seventy. 5,000 words, that's work out the days. Yeah. But that's only the draft one, and then you're spending months and months and months redrafting it and reworking it yeah. and working with an editor. But I, 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 I tend to write um, in the morning time and the afternoon time. I don't tend to write at night time. I know other writers write at this time of night, and I tend to get my best work done in the very early morning. So I can I can rattle a really bad thousand words off in a couple of hours yeah. in the morning. Yeah. Um, but I don't 
I don't beat myself up about it anymore. I used to, but now if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. And so I feel like a lot of people think that as a writer, all you do is write. But as you said, there's a lot of editing and like stuff like that. How do you find that? Do you find it dampens your creative spirit or are you okay with it? Well, it, the, uh, the editing's a tough thing. I mean, a lot of people tell you that that's when the book is really written, you know. With the M word, I mean, the M word was, I think, probably about 30, 40,000 words were cut from it after I wrote the first draft. Um, and this has gone through about six edits, six redrafts. So it was really a labour. Yeah. And then when you get to that end draft, you're like, this isn't creative anymore. It's just... Mm it's coloured by numbers type thing. Yeah. I mean, even even today I was I was uh, copy editing a book. Now, copy editing is a very end product. When you're not creating, it's just like, well, on page 14, you said the character had blue eyes, but on page 212, he's suddenly got green eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's changing those little inconsistencies. Um, and somebody does that for you, a copy editor will do that. And then when you're going through that whole process, looking at all the comments, yeah. it becomes a little bit painful. Yeah, so be warned. <laughs> but, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that painful, is it? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah sorry now, I'll just go back and look at my questions. No problem. <laughs> um, so, oh yeah, this is actually a question that I have. Um, so I feel like, a lot of writers that I've spoken to have told me like, you know, you just got to go for it, like send off your stuff everywhere. But do you think that a big ego helps or hurts a writer? Um, I think if you've got a big ego in anything, you're going to be let down. Mm -hmm. I think if you've, I think that all creative arts <clears throat> is all about being, I mean, not all about, that's not right. It's, you're always going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to be number one. You're mm. not going to win all the awards. Your book isn't going to be a bestseller. Mm. Your third book isn't going to do as well as your first book. Or that fourth book done well in, do you know what I mean? There's all, it's everything's fraught with disappointment. Or you're looking at papers, national papers, or literary festivals and going, why is he or she in that and I'm not? And do you see what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's a constant battle. If you, if, what I tend to do is, and I've done that game. I've been in that world because it's hard not to be. Yeah. But I think it's very, very important not to look left and right. Yeah. Just to keep on your own path and keep looking forward. Yeah. Um, and an ego, if you've got an ego, I think it'll affect your writing. It'll affect what you, what you produce. Yeah. So when you started writing, did you think that it would get to this point like say when you were in college or as a teacher, did you ever see yourself as a full-time writer? No, not at all. I want. I think I, never, I didn't want to be. You know, you hear other you hear other writers that say, "Yeah, I was, I was born reading Agatha Christie." <laughs> you know, and I, I always knew I wanted to be a writer when I was four yeah. or ten or a student. I never, I never, I didn't even, I never harboured a dream. I never had a desire to do it at all. Yeah. Um, until I, I probably went to uni and I, I wanted to, I didn't want to be a novelist, I wanted to be a playwright actually. Mm. Um, among other things I studied, I studied theatre. Yeah. So I was interested in that element of it. Um, and, and then I guess I just started like everybody else, you start writing little stories, short stories that grow into longer stories. And then I wrote my first novel, which was rejected a lot of times, never unpublished. I wrote a second novel which was unpublished, both of them were rubbish. I wrote a book of short stories, which was unpublished. Yeah. And at that point, you're thinking three books, lots of hours, lots of endurance, lots of uh, late nights, mm. and no return, lots of rejections. So you kind of think you're not going to be a full-time writer, but I still wanted a book published, I guess. And that's it. That's the ego driving it. Yeah. Um, and when I was, and here's my other sort of bit of arrogance, is that when I was a teacher, I thought a lot of the books that I was given fourth year, 
a fourth year class at the time, I thought I could do better than that. Yeah. Not as a writer, but I could do better to engage these students. Mm, yeah. And I wrote, I wrote my first book for, for teenagers, which got published. Okay, so you started off writing not for teenagers, and then yeah. you went into that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I start, and I didn't. I only wrote one book. I only con. I've only consciously written one book for teenagers. I mean, I didn't. I didn't consciously write this for a teen. Oh, market. Well. I just. I just had a story, and I just wrote it. Yeah. But you kind of get pigeonholed as this YA author. Mm. Um, and the stories that I had in my head just just so happened to have teen protagonists in it. Okay, that's actually really interesting that you so, say that, yeah. So I didn't, I, I, I didn't really market myself or think of myself as a YA author. Yeah. Other people, my publisher did that for me. <laughs> that's what they're for. That's what they're for. <laughs> and and they see a market for that. And actually, the, I tell you, the book that I've just read, the book that I've just written, is for a teen audience, a younger teen mm-hmm. audience. And then the next book that, that I'm writing is, is, I guess you could call it an adult book. So how many different projects then would you have on the go at any okay. one time? Okay, on the go at, the, at this moment in time, um, well, I've, I've, I'm, I'll call it a project, the book that I've just finished, the book that I've just copy edited, it's finished then. So that's one project. Um, I'm writing an adult book <clears throat> at the moment, so I'm, I'm pretty well on with that and I'm doing uh, I'm I'm developing something for for television Ooh. <laughs> so there's 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 yeah three projects yeah and I'm and I'm still trying to learn the guitar <laughs> well now we're in lockdown you'll have loads of time to do it all yeah. so, so. Uh, and so with this new book when will we be expecting to be able to read it um, to, well, April, I guess April, it's, it's due out in April, but that, I mean, that, that could change, mm. who knows, um, yeah, so hopefully April, that will come out, it's called Cardboard Cowboys. Oh, I'll keep an eye out for it, so, yeah. <laughs> and so what has to happen then between you copy editing, editing it, say, and then, like, April? Right, so what will happen now is the copy edit, so probably they'll come, another round will come back to me. Yeah. And then they'll send that will be signed off, mm-hmm. and then they'll they'll create a cover for it. So they'll do all the design. They're doing that at the moment. They're doing all the designs for the covers, and then probably in I'd say January, yeah. they'll have a proof copy. I don't know if you you know the proof copies. Let's see if I've got one here. So they bring out a, they bring it. They tend to bring out a proof copy of a book beforehand, and the proof copy is like. It'll be the book, but it won't be the cover, and it'll say uncorrected proof on it somewhere. Okay. And that, and you've got to read that book because that may that may have some mistakes in it. It might just have little punctuation mistakes. It might have spelling mistakes. It just so that's your that's your very very last opportunity in book form mm. to to fix all the mistakes if any mistakes are in it. And then after that, it gets published. Okay. Yeah. And then after that wins world domination. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. And do you have a say in the covers that get picked? I do actually, yeah. I mean, I've been quite, I mean, my, my early books, I think maybe when I was a bit um, less experienced, actually, uh, I felt I didn't have a voice in that world. You know, I'd felt or somebody would just give me the covers and I would say, oh, that's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. But now I've got much, uh, as every book that comes out, your voice is a little bit stronger about it. So there was there was this book here, which came without the head, you know, the heads on the feathers here? Yeah. So I, I kind of wanted that, and uh, and we got that. Uh, the the Bombs book, uh, not that book, do you, see, uh, do you see the T-shirt there? Yeah, the Smiths. Right, I'm a big Smiths fan. Yes. <laughs> and I wanted the Smiths one. And all my books, I always get music in them. All my characters listen to music. Yeah. Right. A lot of them play music. Yeah. 
And it's just, it's, that's just a writer, that's just me as a writer's trick. I might be listening to a band the day I'm writing that scene. And I'll yeah. go, oh, Jesus, I'll just I'll put the Smiths on there, that's whatever. Yeah, I actually got a good few song recommendations as I was reading nah, the Nah, there's, there's, there's loads. You know? Yeah, there is. I love yeah. the character, um, Ian, who... Oh, went, he's, yeah. He he's just a, he's, loves music. I thought that was very he's good. He's a music guy. Yeah. And then there's, there's it's like... They, they do say that writers write the same book throughout their career right enough, so a lot of my characters are Ian. Yeah, you know? <laughs> well, I liked Ian. <laughs> so I made, I made sure in this cover that, that the Smith's T-shirt was on. Yeah. And I also, I also really pushed for the terrain in the background yeah. to kind of demonstrate the, the, the town where I grew up, yeah. in Scotland. So they, they kindly did that for me. And I think, it, I, I personally think it's a really nice cover. I yeah, like I really liked it. So. Good. And so I think we're kind of coming up to, t uh, to time now, but I just have one last question, which is, okay. what is your favourite character that you've ever written and why? Uh, my favourite character is, oh God, that's a tough, tough question because at the end of the day, I love all the, I love the, all the main characters that I write. But I guess it must. It's got to be. It's got to be the Michelle character and and when Mister Dog bites, purely because she morphed into Maggie. Yeah. Right. And I like that. And I like. I like. It's hard when you're. It's hard when you're. I mean, I'm nearly fifty, and I'm writing. It's a tough ask for that that male age to mm -hmm. write a teenage female, especially yeah. especially in the days that we're in, um, and. To date, nobody said that I've I haven't achieved it well. Yeah, you did. I actually, as so, I was reading it, I wanted to make sure. I was like, it's definitely a man that I'm interviewing here now, <laughs> with this seventeen-year-old girl voice. I was like, Jesus. And but that's but that's it. You've always got an. I've always got good readers as well. That's another thing. If you want to be right, I have good readers around you. Mm. Um, and like my editors are my editors are women and. Mm. A lot of people that I give it to would be females to read, and and I, I really do want to accurately portray somebody. I don't want to misrepresent anybody at all. Yeah. So Maggie, I'm going to say Maggie. I like Maggie. Yeah, that's Maggie's a, Maggie. And have you received much criticism over your writing career? Like, do you let that get to you, or do you kind of loads, just... loads of criticism? Yeah. Yeah. And would you yeah. let? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I think I think this, for example, this book. Yeah. Right, when Mr. Dog bites, that's that that's been banned in a few places because <laughs> because of its swearing content. Well, you know you've done well when you've gotten a book banned. Now, in fairness, that's good. That's good going. I, I think it's banned because it's rubbish. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think early on when people criticize, when you when you, I mean, now I don't even go on Amazon and read reviews or anything. I don't do that. Yeah. But early the stages of my career, I did, and when people, when Joe from Stoke on Trent said, "I'm not reading this guy ever again because he's rubbish." <laughs> I used to, I, I would, that would pain me. <laughs> but now I don't care. You know, I think what's important to me is that people have an opinion, and because I've got an opinion about things that I don't like, yeah. And I'm, a, and I'm, I'm ready to tell anybody who'll listen. <laughs> yeah. Listen, you hear that song? I mean, did you hear that album? It's so bad. Yeah. Um. And I quite like I quite like the the polarization. Yeah. I mean, it'd, it'd be dull to get five star reviews and everybody think you're ama you're amazing all the time, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be bad either, though. I wouldn't say no to that. I think the important thing is if I finish a book and I go, I've done the best job I can in this, and I can't do any better. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. I mean, there was a review I read in the the Irish Times at the weekend. Mm. That was a really horrible, scathing vindictive almost personal yeah. takedown of uh, I don't know if you read it or heard about it of Dolly Alderton's new book I did hear that yes now you've also got to understand in, in life that people are human beings and people are sensitive yeah. and people by all means say your book's dreadful but yeah. there's no need to kick somebody when they're feeling very vulnerable yeah no, I agree. And and that would be the one that would kill any writer if you get a really vindictive review. Mm. That's that's really really poor. 
Yeah, and but do you think there is such a thing as constructive criticism? Would Absolutely. you take people's opinions on board, do, or do yeah, you think? Of course. Oh yeah, okay. So you would. Yeah, I do it all. I do it all the time. You know, yeah. it's it's like the. I mean, I still even to this day, if a book's rejected by my publisher. Yeah. And my publisher says you need to do this, this, and this. Or my editor would say you need to do this. Or my agent would say you need to do this. And if you're closed, if you're closed-minded, and you're going to believe that what you're doing constantly is the right thing mm-hmm. to do and the right direction to take, well, you're going to struggle. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So kill and, your darlings, basically. Well, you've got. To, I mean, don't create the darlings anyway <laughs> in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But kill your darlings definitely because it's well you think you might have written the best sequence or the best scene or the best sentence or whatever it just might not be good enough or it might not fit into the whole pattern of what you're writing or the character might not say that phrase for example but you've got to take criticism on board yeah. criticism is there to help yeah very good. Well, I think I could probably chat all night, but I think we're coming up to the 40 minute mark and I don't want to get in trouble. So I think yeah, we're going to have to <laughs> leave it at this. So thank you so much, everybody, for watching this interview. Yeah, and thank God, you. I, for- I forgot people might be watching this. <laughs> if they get this far, I'm going to be very impressed with them. I know. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Yeah. I, hope we haven't- I hope I haven't bored you. <laughs> and thank you, Brian, for doing this interview with A me. Pleasure, Libby. <laughs> thank you.